Thanks. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Pastor Gena, for allowing us to come here, my wife and I to come here and stand in front of your congregation. I know that pastors are to be very protective of their pulpit. I understand that, but you have uh, entrusted us to come here and do that. And we're just glad to come here and, and to be with you and to worship together with you. Vera is here as well. Vera, why don't you just wave for these folk here? She's right over there in that corner. And we just enjoy coming here. You know, I want to say this, that I appreciate my wife very, very much. It's uh, about 44 years that she has been my partner in ministry. She has been a partner in ministry, not just mine, but in the Lord's ministry. And I want to say that I so appreciate what she has done. Congregation, I have to congratulate you on your, your building. What a job. What a job. It's so nice. It looks totally different than when we were here before. And that's 20 years ago now. And I look out over the congregation and I see some of you folk, you are from, some of you are familiar faces. Uh, some of you, well, I'm going to get to know you. I'd like to get to know you. But, uh, you know, even some of those familiar faces that I see here, you haven't changed an awful lot. But I can even pick out exactly where you're sitting. <laughs> because over 20 years, you haven't changed. <laughs> At any rate, I could tell you stories about seminary about us when we sat in the same place all the time. Well, maybe I will. Maybe I will, but it's not really a reference to you or about you. We were sitting, we had a class of about 100 students in seminary. And the teacher, being trying to make a little light of the thing, he says, you know, you guys are all sitting in the same place all the time. He says, you sure are a bunch of stereotyped guys. So the next day, we decided to change that. And we just, just moved around, and we did everything different, and everybody sat in a different place. Confused him big time. <laughs> and he said, I've never seen such a bunch of insecure guys as you. <laughs> So it didn't matter what we did. It just didn't seem to be right. But nevertheless, that's just how things go. But anyway, good to see you. Thank you for allowing us to come and worship together with you today. Well, we're not that far removed from New Year's Day. And the last uh, two Sabbaths ago, Vera and I were at the College Heights Church and during Sabbath school time, the Sabbath school su superintendent said, uh, uh, what are your New Year's resolutions? Well, in the big church like that, something similar to what we have here, there are not a whole lot of people spoke up. But uh, anyway, so the next uh, day or next uh, week or so, I went to, the, went to uh, the internet and I looked up to see what kind of New Year's resolutions do people make? And there's lists and lists and lists of that, but... Perhaps you could put them into a category of about four, uh, four different kinds. One is physical health. The other one is finances. Another one is relationships. And the fourth one ended up being people would like to get more involved in volunteer work. All good resolutions. Of course, there's one that's missing, obviously. But what struck me is on that Sabbath morning when the superintendent called for New Year's resolutions, one man spoke up, and here's what he said. I want to make this year my closest walk with Jesus. That's a great New Year's resolution, isn't it? You see, our relationship with Jesus impacts everything else that we do. Our relationship with Jesus impacts our work. It impacts our entertainment. It'll impact our health and our lifestyle. And so this morning, I'd like to spend just a little time, maybe on a Bible study, if you please, a closer walk with Jesus. That's the intent. I do hope you have your Bibles. The passage that we want to spend time in this morning is Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12 
verses 1 and 2. And we read, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we want to answer four questions. One, what does it mean to present our bodies a living sacrifice? Two, what motivates us to be a living sacrifice? Number three, what does it look like in practical terms? And number four, how can I do this genuinely? The entire Old Testament, including the Israelite life, revolved around worship. And worship revolved around the sanctuary. And the hub of the sanctuary was sacrifice. Now there's two types of sacrifice that we read about in scripture. One of those is what we call a dead sacrifice or a blood sacrifice. Immediately my mind goes to the Old Testament and I think of altars. I think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think of them offering sacrifices on their, their altars. I think of the sanctuary service in the wilderness, the slaying of the lamb, of the bull, or the ram, or the heifer, or whatever it might be. And I'm almost revolted at the thousands upon thousands of animals that were slaughtered as sacrifices during the dedication of Solomon's temple. And to think that God ordained all of this killing. Of course... We have the New Testament, and we have the letters of Paul and the book of Hebrews, and we understand what all of that means. Here is a gracious God who is dealing with the whole sin problem in our, on our behalf. He is driving home three messages. One, sin is hideous, and its consequences is death. Secondly, God is taking our sin upon himself, and he's paying the penalty. And the third message, the third message is really an appeal. Sometimes we think of it as a threat, but it is a warning. Turn from your sins. Why would you die? No one has to die because Jesus has paid the price. Why would you die? As a young pastor, I can still see the word picture that George Vandeman painted as he explained the sanctuary service. Suppose, suppose that I am an Israelite. And suppose that I have done something wrong. I have committed a transgression. I have sinned. And so, George Vandeman says, as an Israelite, you have to go to the, your flock of sheep. You have to pick out a lamb of a, certain, uh, of a certain gender, a lamb of a certain age, a lamb that has no blemish, absolutely perfect, not blind, not lame, Nothing wrong with it, and you take that lamb, you put it on, a, on your shoulder, or you lead it to the sanctuary. At the sanctuary, you are met by the priest. The priest knows the reason why you are there. You have transgressed. And so, the priest now says to you, you need to place your hands over the head of that lamb, and you need to confess your transgression thereby transferring your guilt to the, you can talk to me, the what? The lamb. And so the guilt goes to the lamb. Then the priest will give me a knife. And I have to be the one to take the life of that lamb. I have to plunge that knife into the throat of that lamb. 
And as that lamb is lying there bleeding to death, the priest will now catch some of that blood in a basin. He will take that into the holy place in front of the curtain that separates the most holy place from the holy place. He will put his fingers in that basin of blood and he will sprinkle blood on the veil or on the curtain. Do you know what blood does when it hits fabric? It stains it. And so the record of my sin has now been transferred to the sanctuary. Some of that blood will splatter on the ground. But the record is there. The priest comes back out again and he says, Your sins have been resolved. The record is now in the sanctuary. You can go free. But I am sure that that priest must have said to him, you are not under condemnation anymore, but go and sin no more. That's what Jesus said at one point. This is what all of that killing was all about. It is a vivid and graphic object lesson of how a loving God would someday send his own son to die and pay the penalty for my sin. It was not to appease an angry God. That wasn't its purpose. An angry God who was lashing out on fury over what I have done. But it's a statement that sin is serious business, it's costly, and it's in a language that they could understand. This is what is called a dead sacrifice or a blood sacrifice. Now, the, the pagans and the heathens around them, they were also accustomed to blood sacrifices. They would do the same thing. They would offer many sacrifices, but their purpose was different. Their reason for doing it was to appease their gods. It was to try to please them so that the gods would give them what they wanted. And so it became a selfish motive. Whereas for the Israelites... It was God paying a penalty for our sin. It wasn't really difficult. It wasn't difficult for the Israelites to fall into that same trap as the pagans fell into. Because so many times they, they kind of looked at the pagans and they said, you know, that's, that looks intriguing. And they went and they started to worship in the same way, thinking that they were appeasing an angry God or getting what they would want to get if the gods were happy with them. You know, as I think about that, I wonder if sometimes we as Christians don't fall into a similar trap when we think that maybe my works is going to help me get what I want, eternal life. And so I've got to be good so that God will love me and therefore give me salvation. No, I'm not, please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying we shouldn't keep the Ten Commandments. We should. We should offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. But why are we doing it? That becomes the question. <clears throat> the other type of sacrifice besides being a dead sacrifice, is a living sacrifice. And that's what Romans chapter 12 is talking about. There are two other passages in the New Testament that imply a living sacrifice. Want to read those? Hebrews chapter 13. Go to Hebrews chapter 13. <clears throat> and we can read verses 15 and 16. Hebrews 13. 15 and 16. <clears throat> now, it may not use the word living sacrifice, but when you read this, see if you wouldn't think that this is really living sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of what? Praise. The sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips 
giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Would you say that this is a living sacrifice? Absolutely. Another one is 1 Peter chapter 2. If you just go over two letters, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 4 and 5. Take a look. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by man, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Again, spiritual sacrifices. And then, of course, we have Romans chapter 12, verse 1, which is really the most clear, where it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. So, if we have been asked to give a living sacrifice, what is it that would motivate you to do that? Why should we do it? Well, he does tell us, he says, he does say that, um, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Because of God's mercy, we should offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, what's the mercies of God? Actually, interestingly enough, Romans chapters 1 through 11 describes for us what the mercies of God is. You can read all of that, and of course, you begin to understand that it is what Jesus did for us. I want to summarize this. I'd like to summarize Romans chapters 1 through 11 this way. I want to do it with a parable. I don't know about you, but I understand things better by parables, stories, illustrations. I like that because now I can understand it. I'm going to read it to you. And I'm, see if you don't think that this summarizes Romans 1 through 11. After living what I thought was a decent life, my time on earth had come to an end. The first thing I remember is sitting in the waiting room of a courthouse. The doors opened and I was instructed to come in and have a seat by the defense table. As I looked around, I saw the prosecutor, a villainous-looking gent who snarled at me as he looked at me. I looked to my left, and there sat my attorney, a kind and gentle-looking man whose appearance seemed so familiar to me. I felt I knew him. The corner door flew open, and there appeared the judge in full flowing robes. He commanded an awesome presence as he moved across the room. He took his seat and he said, let us begin. The prosecutor rose and he said, my name is Satan. And I am here to show you why this man belongs in hell. He proceeded to tell of lies that I had told, things that I stole, and th times when I cheated others. Satan told of other horrible perversions that were once in my life. And he spoke, and the more he spoke, the further I sank in my seat. I was so embarrassed that I couldn't look at anyone, even my own attorney. As the devil told of sins that even I had completely forgotten about. As upset as I was with Satan, I was equally upset with my attorney, who sat there silently not offering any form of defense at all. I know that I have been guilty of all those things, but I had done some good in my life. Couldn't all that at least equal out some, for, account for something? Satan finished with a fury, and he said, This man belongs in hell, he is guilty, and there is not a person who can prove otherwise. When it was his turn, my attorney first asked if he might approach the bench. The judge allowed this over the strong objection of Satan and beckoned him to come forward. As he got up and started walking, I was able to see him in his full splendor and majesty. I realized this was Jesus representing me, my Lord and Savior. 
he stopped at the bench and softly said to the judge, Hi, Dad. <laughs> and then he turned and he dressed the court. Satan was correct in saying that this man has sinned. I won't deny any of those allegations. And yes, the wages of sin is death. And this man deserves to be punished. Jesus took a deep breath. And he turned to his father with outstretched arms and he proclaimed, However, I died on the cross so that this person might have eternal life. And he has accepted me as his savior. He is mine. My attorney continued. His name is written in the book of life. And no one can snatch him from me. Satan still doesn't understand. This man is not to be given justice, but mercy. As Jesus sat down, he, quiet, he quietly paused, looked at his father, and he said, There is nothing else that needs to be done. I've done it all. The judge lifted his mighty hand, and he slammed the gavel down. The following words bellowed from his lips, This man is free. The penalty for him has already been paid in full. Case dismissed. As my Lord led me away, I could hear Satan ranting and raving. I won't give up. I will win the next one. I asked Jesus, as he gave me my instructions where to go next, have you ever lost a case? He smiled and he said, Everyone that has come to me and asked me to represent him has received the same verdict as you, paid in full. Congregation, I ask you this question. If this parable is an honest representation of the truth, if this is an honest representation of Romans chapters 1 through 11, therefore... I beg you, I beseech you, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Is that not reasonable? The next question is practical. What does a living sacrifice look like? And Paul, fortunately, does not allow us to have our own opinion as to what a living sacrifice looks like. That's exactly what Romans chapters 12, verses 3 through chapter 15, verse 13 is all about. He is now describing what a living sacrifice will look like in my life and your life. Let me just summarize some of those points that he makes. For instance, evidently a living sacrifice has an attitude of humility by comparison to an attitude of pride. You see, the world promotes pride. Unfortunately, though, pride can sometimes even creep into the church. It can come in to us. But Paul is pretty specific in what he's saying about the church in his day. And so I'm going to illustrate it. I'm, I'm exaggerating. I'm going to exaggerate to make the point and you must remember, I'm not referring to this congregation when I'm, what I'm going to do next. All right? So you understand. But it was true in his day. <clears throat> Suppose that there was a social gathering. Suppose that there is a social gathering. And in that social gathering, you have your congregation, your members, and your officers, and all of the people are there. And just suppose that there is an unbeliever, that there is an unbelieving couple that attend. They've been invited to attend, and they come. And so this unbelieving couple, being the charismatic people that they are, they're engaged in conversation with the members of the church. And so the gentleman says to one of the people that are standing in a circle talking, and just as exactly what is it that you do in this congregation? What is it that you do with this organization you call Christian? Well, I'm, I'm a deacon in this congregation. 
I'm, in fact, you know, I'm very important here and they need me here because I open the doors and I make sure the heat is turned on right or the air conditioning is on. I make sure the congregation is comfortable here. By the way, I take up the offering. That is a very important duty. Oh, yeah, says another one. He's a deacon, and yes, he's, been, he's had the laying on of hands, but I'm an elder in this church. I'm an elder here, and uh, I don't bother with the doors, and I don't bother with the air conditioning. I preach occasionally, and I teach occasionally, and uh, I visit the church members. My job is very important. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. And, and these people are members of my congregation, but I'm the pastor here. I take care of all of these people. Oh, really? And then the wife chimes in and says, and ma'am, what do you do? Oh, I'm, I'm denominationally employed. I'm the church school teacher. Very important. I take care of the children. <laughs> yes, says another. She's a church school teacher, but I'm the professor at the university. I have my PhD. Well, another person steps forward and pipes up and says, These people are members of a local congregation, but I'm the president of the conference. And I have lots of people and lots of congregations to take care of. <laughs> you get the point. I, I, I'm talking about pride, okay? And I'm not saying that that is true here. What I am saying is that that's what was true in Paul's day. Because when you read verses 4, uh, uh, 3, and, to, and onward to about verse 9, that's exactly what he's addressing. He is saying that people... All of the spiritual gifts that God has given are equally important. You don't think of one as being more important than the other. So, a living sacrifice has an attitude of humility versus pride. Well, going on to verses 9 through 14, he's talking about spirit, uh, living sacrifice puts other people first. He talks about genuine love versus, versus pretentious loving. By the way, do you know what pretentious loving is? Pretentious love simply means that you love somebody, you do good things for somebody in order to get it back. It's selfish. But rather, genuine love means I love people because it's the right thing to do and I'm not expecting anything back again. Well, he goes on about uh, a living sacrifice is giving deference to another. I know we all like to receive credit, and that is good in its right place. Think of the story of John Cairns, a respected and rever a revered Scottish scholar and pastor, a humble man but exceptionally brilliant. He was part of a platform party of two, two people, and as he stepped through the door, just barely stepping through the door, he stepped aside and he let the other man go first. And with all of that, there was the, the, the audience broke out in an applause. And as he followed, he was applauding as well. He was thinking that they were applauding the man in front of him when actually they were applauding him. Giving deference to one another. Living sacrifice, rejoice in hope. When Alexander the Great embarked on one of his eastern campaigns, he lavished gifts on his friends until he had virtually nothing left. And one of his own friends said, uh, Sir, you will have nothing left for yourself. Oh, yes, I will. I have my hopes. Folk, rejoicing in hope. We have the greatest hope ever. We have the second coming to look forward to. That is the great hope. And no matter what happens to us, we can rejoice because we have 
this great hope. Someone said one time, there is no such thing as a hopeless Christian. Well, living sacrifice is hospitality. Christianity is the religion of open hand, open heart, open house, open door. Living sacrifice is living peacefully. That's according to verses 15 to 21. Living peacefully with everybody. In other words, don't hold a grudge. That's pretty hard to do, isn't it? You know, if somebody does something not good for you, isn't it easy to hold a grudge and say, well, you know, I just don't like that guy, I don't like that person. But the question is, what if that person has done something really, really, really hard on you, very bad? I think of the story of Dr. Martin Luther King Sr. Sr. It happened on a stifling hot Sunday morning in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Martin Luther King was preparing to stand up and preach. His wife, Christina King, was at the organ. For 40 years, she had been the organist and the choir director of that congregation, of the Ebenezer Baptist Church. Her name was Christina, but her husband called her Honey Bunch, or Bunch for short. And on that Sunday, Mrs. King was playing the organ and the choir was singing the Lord's Prayer. They were just singing those words, forgive us our debts, when a deranged man jumped up, pulled out two pistols, and fired at Mrs. King. She slumped over the organ. Dr. King ran to her. Bunch, are you hurt? Where are you hurt? But in minutes, she lay dead in his arms. Two years later, Dr. King was a guest lecturer at a seminary. The incident obviously had taken its toll, and, is, and at the age of 76, he, he wasn't quite as, as active as he once had been. But he still answered questions cheerfully and with contagious enthusiasm. But one of the questions caused him great concern. What do you think about seeking the death penalty for the murderer of your wife? That question aroused a great emotional response. Oh, please, he begged, don't let them do that. He's just a boy. The death penalty won't bring her back. Please don't let them kill him. God has been too good to me for me to hate. God has forgiven him. I have forgiven him. Don't make him die. Over and over again, he emphasized how God had been so good to forgive. And because God had forgiven, Daddy King could reach down into a bruised and broken heart and forgive the one who had murdered his wife. Daddy King could live at peace with everyone, regardless of what had happened. And so, a living sacrifice lives at peace with his fellow men and women. Well, we could go on and on. Could talk about non-judgmentalism. We could talk about being subject to the government. This is what Paul is talking about. He's talking about loving your neighbors, yourself, keeping the Ten Commandments. He's talking about a calm assurance. Question is, how is it possible to live such a living sacrifice genuinely? We can sometimes fake it, but how can we do it Genuinely. Well, verse 2 in Romans chapter 1, ch chapter 12 rather, verse 2 tells us how. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what it takes. How is that possible? I'm not going to go into a great rhetoric on that. I'm going to tell you a story a story that George Vandeman tells on how it is possible. Suppose, he says, suppose that there is a wolf that goes to the precipice, precipice of a cliff and he looks down into the meadows and there he sees the sheep that are grazing. And he says to himself, I wish I were a sheep. I want to become a sheep. 
It looks so peaceful because their dinner doesn't run away from them. And so he goes back into his den. He puts on a sheep's skin and he trots down into the meadow and he looks to see what the sheep are doing. And he sees the sheep have their nose to the ground and they are biting off grass and chewing it and swallowing it. And so he says, that's what sheep do, that's what I will do. And he puts his nose down on the ground and he bites off grass and he chews and he swallows, but it tastes horrible. In fact, it has no taste at all, especially when he thinks of that choice morsel that's sitting back in his den. Pretty soon he can't stand it anymore and he trots back to his den and he has his dinner over there. And then he comes back down again into the, and he notices the sheep have gone to the stream for water. And he watches to see, and they are sticking their nose into the water, and they suck up the water. And so he puts his nose in, and he sucks up water, and he sucks it into his lungs. Because a wolf doesn't suck water, it laps water. George Vandeman says this. He says, is it possible for a wolf to become a sheep? What would you say? No. Then he puts, his, puts the point even further and he says, so what would it take for that wolf to become a sheep? That's a question that's a little harder to answer. What would it take for a wolf to become a sheep? And then he answers, and he says, it would take a miracle. And then he drives his point home, and he says, that's what it will take for you to become a living sacrifice. It will take a miracle. How does that happen? How does that happen? I want that miracle in my life. I want to be a living sacrifice. After the mercy that's been extended to me, it's only reasonable that I now live for him. How? I have to invite Jesus into my heart. I need to ask the Holy Spirit to take control. Here's how it's done. One paragraph. Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be, take me, O Lord, as holy thine, I lay all my plans at your feet. Use me today in your service. Abide with me and let all my work be wrought in you. And then the writer of Steps to Christ, page 70, says, This is a daily matter. Each morning consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender all your plans to him, to be carried out or given up as his providence shall indicate. And thus, day by day, you may be giving your life into the hands of God. And thus, your life will be molded more and more after the life of Christ. I say to you, as you determine to walk with Jesus this year, may that be your prayer. God bless you.